Eh. All right. Um, I'm going to have to gauge this because I'm not sure how loud this is going to be. So we're going to just go ahead. Uh, we'll pull it up. I'm going to do... We'll switch it over to, to the game stream. Set up here. Nope. Uh, primary monitor. Zaboom. All right, let's do it. Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier episode five, Truth, in which Julia Louis Dreyfus leaves John Walker more dumbstruck than a shield to the face. Peace, Mark. Uh, Gore, thanks for stopping in, man. Break down all Appreciate the, the comments. You might have missed have in this fun. episode. So we open on John Walker mid sprint, just like how Captain America: The Winter Soldier opens for Sam Wilson and Steve Rogers in the middle of their runs. Except this Cap is running from his problems, not interested in making friends. Yeah, Listen man. Worst music. thing he could have done was like run from the scene. If he was, like I said, if he was confident in what he did and his actions. Poser he would have stayed and recalls his music from Captain America Civil War. You also hear this light motif later. This whole fight mirrors that two on one fight that ended that film in which Bucky teams up to take down a rival who is filled with rage over a dead loved one. Now Sam's focus goes to the blood. Except this time shield. his cap is Sam. Yeah, notice Hell the yeah. vibranium hums. A sound effect they often do with the shield to indicate its kind of weird mystical qualities. But here it's boosted up as if Steve's spirit is dismayed at these stains. Now Bucky tries to calm John. Don't go down that road. Believe me, it doesn't end well. I'm not like you. Yeah, notice how Bucky just takes this in, biting his tongue, letting the other two talk for a bit, and he only speaks up once more in the last line spoken right before punches are thrown. You don't want to do this. Bucky never takes his eyes off the shield uh, until that moment. This fight move by move because everything is amazing in it. Early on, Bucky grapples with Walker and goes for his down? gun, smartly disarming him as soon as possible, and he knocks that gun loose. Oh, but in response, I Walker didn't actually in catch slow that. motion raises the shield to bring it down on Bucky's head, just like he did to Nico. So we're freaking out, but Sam jumps <laughs> in to save Bucky. I'm gonna have shield PTSD. Happens again at the end of the battle when Walker brings that shield down on Sam this time until Bucky returns the favor. I love the way Sam uses his wings in this fight. First yeah, using man. one to slap that shield out of Walker's left hand before he catches it with his right. And then later Sam backspins on his wings to trip Walker. That and was one Walker of my favorite moves Bucky, in that fight. Knocks him off his feet, Bucky catches the shield and briefly wields it. If you think about it every time on the series when John Walker flings something at Bucky, Bucky <laughs> always catches it. Walker yeah, throws he, Bucky, smashes he just keeps his throwing arm, shit at Bucky like that. Briefly, though it appears to recover shortly after sam tries to tether the shield similar to how peter parker webbed the shield in civil war out of cap's hands but it doesn't work walker pins him rips off his wings and they restrain walker to try to pull the shield off his arm similar to thanos the moments dogpiling on thanos yeah. to remove the infinity gauntlet until inevitably using the force of sam's jetpack they freaking break his arm Oh. If you think about it though, Steve Rogers' arm was also broken as he fought Thanos in Endgame. Remember there was that close up where he tightened the shield strap as a tourniquet. So in that way, Steve fused the shield with himself to make himself whole, whereas Walker breaks himself over his attachment to that shield. I mean, throughout the MCU, one of the best things about this shield is yeah. the way it's been used in collabs. And here <laughs> is another collab for those books. Now, Bucky drops the shield for Sam, another mirror of the way Cap dropped the shield for Tony in Civil War. And as he does this, he is bathed in these beams of sunlight. This is a getting Steve's blessing to return his spiritual symbol to its rightful place. Are we going right to find out drop, a little glimmer if he's of light dead? Reflects off the shield. Like, and they act Bucky like walks Steve off, is again the music. dead. Dead. Yeah, the composer is bringing back the end of the line music that he composed for Captain America Winter Soldier. That was the moment when Cap dropped the shield to show his friendship to Bucky. I'm not gonna fight you. You're my friend. Later on, Torres tells Bucky, Hey, you got your uh, you got your sleeve back. <laughs> calling back Bucky tearing off his sleeve before that dumb jump out of the plane in episode two. And Sam tells Torres to take his broken wings. Wait, yo, you forgot the wings. 
Yes, Joaquin Torius does become a version of the Falcon in the comics when Sam becomes Captain America. So we could be looking at the origin for New Falcon. I mean, Sam's line here does feel a bit like Tony's moment with that pre-recast Rhodey in Iron Man. Next time, baby. Yeah, more like next time, boom. boom. You look looking for this? this? Walker goes on trial before a council. You can see the flags for the US Maybe Army, he died Navy, later Air that Force, day. Coast Guard. So I assume after passing the shield on, maybe he chose that the moment. Chairman of the Senate Armed Forces Committee, because he's a senator, they're military people. Maybe this is a government body representing the US delegation to the GRC. Look, it's post blip. Who knows how government works? Then Walker goes, Kavanaugh. I lived my life by your mandates. I dedicated my life to your mandate. And then a very cold. Oh, so good. Me. Yeah, through Walker's rage, we are given a clearer reference point for Isaiah Bradley, who was another super soldier who's just following orders. But in his case, he was not allowed to walk free. So what does John Walker have to complain about? Then Walker is approached by cameo alert. A little cameo. Seinfeld <laughs> and Veep star, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Contessa Valentina Allegra de Fontaine. So you can just call me Val, but don't call me Val. Just keep it in your head. Yes, Contessa Valentina Allegra de Fontaine is a longtime S.H.I.E.L.D. agent in the Marvel comics, often associated with Nick Fury. She goes by Agent 14, and at another point, Madame Hydra, when she joins Hydra. But that was really a short-lived mission when she was actually part of the Leviathan, and she yep. betraying Hydra, undermining them. Yep. Folks, de Fontaine is a lesser-known figure, and a lot of folks right now are jumping on her being Madame Hydra confirmed. But that arc was really just a small part of her run. Yep. Like she plays a big role in Secret Invasion, Placed by a scroll who really kicks off Nick Fury's initial suspicions. She works on a Fim Force team with Sharon Carter. You could jump to the conclusion that she is the power broker. The show has been hinting at, though I think it would be a bit weird to introduce this big cameo right now, but then wait to doubly confirm her as the power broker, a character who is referred to with male pronouns. I mean, she may just represent whatever faction of Hydra is left after they were hunted down and routed. And Julia Louis-Dreyfus seems to be playing it with the same kind of wry humor that Gary Shandling played Hydra loyal Senator Stern. I would have killed the bastard too. I mean, you would have been doing him a favor if you'd taken out the whole lot. Hmm, yeah, DeFonte, it <laughs> sounds like she's part of some shadowy government agency, one without oversight, without a public face, which, yeah, sounds a lot like what Nick Fury initially was doing with S.H.I.E.L.D. And Hydra did corrupt S.H.I.E.L.D., so it is plausible that she could be heading up a secret division of Hydra that's still active somewhere, perpetuated by Zola's algorithm. There we go. Which He's... could mean Empty and my Zola handcar could still arrive at the station. But I don't know, it seems like Marvel just pulled a longtime lesser-known comics operative and plans to do something entirely new with her. So it's not about her history, it's about the plan. You did the right thing taking the serum. Yeah, of course I know about that. It has made you very, very valuable to certain people. Hmm, which certain people? Well, notice that indigo streak in her hair. I think DeFontaine could be at least partly inspired by high-ranking S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Victoria Hand in the comics, deputy director of the Thunderbolts Initiative during the Dark Reign. Now, there you Victoria go, guys. Hand there already you. appeared in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which Kevin Feige well, has been kind of indicating yeah, we know that's really not MCU real. canon, but since we already saw that character in a Marvel TV show, maybe they're pulling a different female S.H.I.E.L.D. operative from Marvel Comics. Either way, it's not just the hair. It's the fact that she values Walker because he took the serum and she knows government secrets and the Dormelage are taking Zemo to the Raft prison. Remember that? That was a facility from Captain America Civil War overseen by Thaddeus Ross, whose name appears in the end credits of the show associated with the Enhanced Humans Act. And we know from the first Hulk film that Ross was deeply interested in rebooting the Super Soldier program. Yep. DeFontaine <clears throat> would work for Ross, recruiting super anti-heroes on a team named after Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross, the Thunderbolts, the anti-hero team in the comics initially headed up by Zemo. I just won't be surprised <laughs> if this season ends with Zemo on the raft, maybe John Walker in the cell next to him as DeFontaine strolls past them, offering them a chance for redemption through the Thunderbolts initiative, where they can join forces with other forgotten Marvel villains like Ghost, we will like see. Agatha Harkness. Don't tell me you don't yeah. want to see Julie Louis Dreyfus and Catherine. We Hall won't see Agatha. Hey, folks, I know you got to look at this dumb face in between all the Easter eggs and theories, which can be a little awkward, especially since I'm not really a skincare aficionado. I kind of associate all right. that stuff with American guys. Psycho, where the people I'm not getting paid for his ad that read, said, so we're skipping it. This one honoring the victims of the Battle of Sokovia and Age of Ultron, which includes Zemo's family. Actually, that lake behind it looks like one formed by the runoff from the upended terrain as the city was lifted. Part of it, and Zemo's music no. from Civil War returns here. 
I really love that melody. Oh, actually, by the way, we have a new Zemo inspired shirt design in our merch store, NewRxersMerch.com. It looks amazing, very cool design, and you can get your hmm. hands on it. Again, NewRxersMerch.com. Now, this statue has a large Sokovian eagle on it with a base showing Russian letters. That last word translates to Sokovia, I think. Now, interestingly, in the December trailer, this shot included a ton of flowers, notes, and flags at the base of the statue and was not yet surrounded by a wall of names or have a paved surface. I get those other changes but why remove the flowers? Well, perhaps the flowers were laid for more recent Sokovian victims of a global pandemic and whatever that removed virus subplot was. Now, they would have changed that before December, but maybe they didn't get around to updating this shot in particular yet. Now, Bucky holds himself to rule number two by not harming Zemo, handing him over to the Dora Milaje. We will take him to the raft where he will live out his days. And I like how they come and go in that Wakandan Talon fighter that we saw in Black Panther. So Sam revisits Eli Bradley, future young Avenger Patriot, and his grandfather, Isaiah Bradley. He carries the shield once more in that art case that Steve had it in, in Endgame, a nod to his sketching hobby. Isaiah cites <laughs> the Red Tails, the famous 332, referring to the 332nd Tuskegee Airmen who fought in World War II. But yep. as the scene goes on, it is George a Lucas made a film about them, right? Scene in which he shares more about his own own tragic history. A handful of us got shot up with different versions of that serum. They tell us it's tetanus. So this episode gets its title, Truth, from the comic series, Truth, Red, White, and Black, which explores Isaiah Bradley's erased history as the Black Captain America. And with this tetanus line, it sounds like this show is referencing the horrific Tuskegee experiments in which the government promised Black syphilis patients free health care, but actually just gave them placebos and let them die. Isaiah goes on to talk about his missions during World War II. A couple of the boys get captured on a mission. I heard the brass talking about blowing the POW camp to hell to hide the evidence. And I brought them boys back. Yeah, think about it. This mirrors Steve Rogers' rescue mission in that first Cap film when he freed hundreds of POWs that were written off as dead, pretty much. But instead of the heroic greeting that Steve got, Isaiah was freaking tortured and imprisoned for 30 years. Isaiah talks about his eventual escape. There was a nurse. God, she the scene is so heartbreaking still. Some fake reports, something. She had me declared dead. Actually, we might have seen that fake death report for Isaiah Bradley in the end credit sequence. So Sam goes back to Louisiana. He helps fix the family boat with some help from Bucky, who brings <laughs> new gear designed by the Wakandans. And we only get a tiny glimpse as Sam opens oh, the I didn't even, I didn't even notice that. Mystery, pulp fiction style. Second. I'm guessing we're going to see new vibranium wings and a color scheme and functionality that incorporate the shield so that Sam could feel comfortable carrying it without feeling like he has to live up to Cap. In fact, I think that could be the deeper meaning of this line. Why didn't you use the metal arm? Well, I don't always <laughs> think of it immediately. I'm right-handed. Yeah, the way Bucky doesn't have to think about his arm, Sam doesn't want to have to think about carrying the shield. So Sharon Carter gives a call to Batchrock. Oh, please, if it weren't for me, you'd still be rotting away in that Algerian prison. <sighs> I can give you double this time. Now, MT speaks a bit of French and was able to translate Batroc's rant as saying that he lost his team on the last mission and that he would never work for Sharon again. Hey, thanks, MT. But this confirms that Batroc's mission in episode one was, in fact, orchestrated by Sharon Carter and her criminal operation in Madripoor. Now, again, I would be surprised if Sharon is revealed to be the power broker herself, not just because of the pronouns, but because Zemo knew the power broker before he was imprisoned in Civil War, before Sharon broke bad. And really, Sharon seems like too much of a foot soldier for a godlike crime boss with spooky Murals. Still, I do think she is part of a criminal organization, maybe working for the power broker, maybe trying to undermine him, and maybe she's sending Batroc in to help the Flag Smashers in their mission against the GRC so that Batroc can gain their trust and then lure them back to Sharon and the power broker. But check out this painting in her art collection. This is the Raft of the Medusa. It's a French romantic painting depicting the infamous wreckage of the French naval frigate, the Medusa. Yeah. Yeah. Leave that to MT to get that right. This is a real ship in history that ran aground and then had a super incompetent captain that recognized that painting. Starve and get super dehydrated and start eating each other. So with all the focus on it here, maybe Sharon actually has plans to stage a history. mutiny on her crime <laughs> boss, the power broker, seeing him as a failure to run a tight ship in Madripoor. So Bucky wakes up to see AJ and Cass playing with the shield. I love that Bucky now so sleeps cute. on the couch instead of on the floor. Definitely a sign of improvement. And they play some catch. 
feels weird. That's some terrifying ass catch, though. Steve when he first picked up the shield in Endgame. What does it feel? Like it's someone else's. Now notice when Sam catches the shield, he braces and recoils with its momentum, whereas Bucky just kind of catches it with a little recoil. Not only is Bucky stronger with his arm and the serum, but this shield is also an awkward fit for Sam still, with a heavier historical weight based off of the dark truths that Isaiah Bradley left him with. But then Bucky reveals... When Steve told me what he was planning, I don't think either of us really understood what it felt like for black man be handed the shield yeah this confirms that bucky and steve did talk over that shield succession off screen during endgame but also interestingly that old cap remembered that plan throughout his entire alternate life before rejoining <laughs> them bucky brings back up steve's notebook and sam says if steve is gone and this might be a surprise but it doesn't matter what steve thought so does gone mean dead, retired, returned to on another the moon. timeline, or on the moon like Torres thinks? I mean, just show us a freaking headstone for the old man and leave the door open to younger Cap in the multiverse and we'll be done with it. Sam tells Bucky that he has to be of service to his victims. That's a true way to make amends, probably setting up Bucky to return to old Mr. Nakajima and tell him the truth about his son next episode. And then Sam's looking hot as he's working out with that shield. All day, man. All day. Uncle could Sam. Be a reference to Cap's catchphrase, I could do this all day. And his nephews calling him Uncle Sam again reflects Sam's growing comfort with bearing these patriotic colors. Meanwhile, the Flag Smashers grow their forces in Tompkins Square Park in New York, somehow getting into the U.S. despite being highly sought after terrorists. Whatever. Batrock hooks them up with some weaponry, and their new <laughs> recruits disrupt a meeting with the GRC who are trying to vote on the Patch Act, which was told to us in a news report on WHIH. And presumably, it'll be here in New York that all these warring parties will meet, including Sharon Carter, whom we see in promo footage, and John Walker with his new homemade shield. He actually hammers that together in this episode's post credit scene. This shield wouldn't hold up to anything that he would face, though. Now, actually, another is another MC thing that kind of bothers me about the whole thing. Just go to black and you hear the clanging of a hammer. Avengers Endgame. These were, of course, a nod to Tony Stark hammering in the cave with the rocks and scraps in the first <laughs> Iron Man. We apologize for that as well in Walker's man cave. Now here, Walker melts down the Congressional Medal of Honor <laughs> that we actually saw him holding this earlier, and he uses this to fuse together the Medal of the Shield. Now, while I doubt this shield is made of vibranium or anything stronger, by being made of the military medals, it does bear a deeper, more personal significance for Walker. We heard him repeat throughout this episode. I am... Captain America. I am Captain America. And this man's gonna be Captain America in his own mind, even if he has to cosplay to do it. But my favorite <laughs> detail of this final shot is once again hidden in his hands. As he spray paints that metal ring, he coats his thumb in a dark red, not at all caring about the blood red stains that he gets on his hands. And yes, this is our Anarchy Assembled shirt, also available at NewRockStarMerch.com. Right, we did it. First live reaction to this. I intended to do this before, but like last time we tried to do it, I mean, it never really came up before, but last time we tried to do it, it was just like the uh, YouTube was having issues, so it didn't really work. Ah, oh, some great, some great moments, man. One division had Mephisto's theories. Falcon and Winter Soldier have power broker. Have we not learned people? I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say that the power broker thing is all that big a deal. In the end, it's not really going to break the universe to know who the power broker is. I don't think so anyway. Like for Mephisto's involvement, it's such a bigger reach. For power broker, it's, I could care less who the power broker is. To be honest, so we'll see where it goes. Then there'll be two post credit scenes. First is Sam going to meet up with Joaquin. He shows him a cosplay. Sam tells him what happened with Steve. We cut the second one, and we'll just see who... Rockstar Theory. Oh, just like the new Rockstar Theory. Yeah, I, I definitely, like I said earlier, uh, I think what they said lines up with what I said, too, if I remember correctly. Um, I think it'll just be setting up the Thunderbolts for an associated team. I was getting really sucked into that, too. The wine probably didn't help, but I was just like, after a while, I was just like entranced by what was going on. Hope Torres gets explored more. If we ever get a season two, I feel like the show, unlike WandaVision, will most likely, more, most likely get one. Um, they've hinted at it. They've they've talked about possibly doing a Falcon and the Winter Soldier season two. So it's very possible we might get a little bit more. 
First two shows of a phase four show in the same pattern. The protagonist has to prove himself worthy of the title, and the villain will have the power similar to the Bane protagonist. And we'll see, we'll see if that continues with Loki. We'll see where that goes. I should do more live reactions. I'd love I I, I would love to do stuff like that. I mean, it's pretty it's it's pretty fun because I can see your guys' initial reactions like right after the fact too. It's um, I mean realistically as a youtuber it's probably not the best thing because the live streams don't get nearly as many views as me posted as a separate video and i still might crop this out and uh include it later but like there was a lot of fun stuff in there guys really dug it so hang out in the live streams you're gonna have some fun yeah so i don't know how i'm gonna edit this to post as a video but we're gonna figure it out Ooh, we got a super chat alexander wilson Julia Louise Dreyfus character was supposed to be introduced in Black Widow. So before COVID, we were supposed to know her character. I forgot about that. Black Widow was supposed to already be out. You know, if you remember too, this was supposed to come out before WandaVision even. So I wonder if she's going to be in there. I wonder if, she, I wonder if we're going to see her in there. And Sheena, Mandy, you guys calm down. I got plenty of wine left. They said this was the last bit of my West Virginia wine. We should do super chats and I take a shot. <laughs> uh, maybe later. We will have a live stream later tonight. We only got 11 minutes. I have to call it quits so I can actually have dinner. I haven't eaten anything today yet except a Hot Pocket. <laughs> and then I've just had all this. I'll, I'll, I've said this before, but just in case you are new to the channel or any of the videos or anything like that, I... uh. My Marvel knowledge pre anything that's in a movie is pretty much all from the 90s Spider-Man cartoon and the 90s X-Men cartoon. Outside of that, it's been the MCU, the Blade movies, the uh, Fantastic Four movies, the Spider-Man movies, all the live action movies. And then from there, whatever I might have researched on my own by just Googling stuff and looking at the Marvel Wiki pages. Aside from that, if they haven't been in any of that stuff, a lot of the stuff is just like secondhand knowledge and um, research. I can see a Dark Avengers Abomination, which is coming back. Abomination is coming back. Justin Hammer, Agatha Harkness. I don't see Agatha being part of a team yet. Norman Osborn, uh, Yelena Belova. White Vision, Venom, USA. I keep forgetting White Vision's out there, man. To be honest, Trick Shot. Don't know who that is. They like Deadshot? Super excited for Black Widow. We need more hand-to-hand -hand combat in the MCU. I'm down for that, man. I'm more. I'm down for more John Wick-style downed and gritty action. That's one of the reasons I really like this show, because a lot of the stuff with Bucky and John and stuff like that is pretty cool seeing hand-to-hand -hand fighting other than the pew-pew laser blasts, which I'm not... I'm a fan of pew-pew laser blasts, but... Sometimes I want to just see some intimate beating the shit up kind of stuff. Yeah, man, I grew up DC. So that's where a lot of my knowledge goes. And I still don't know everything DC. I've still, no, I've still only read a handful of comics. I could count the comics I've read on one hand. Um, a lot of it comes from the animated shows. A lot of it comes from the animated movies. A lot of it comes from the live action stuff and all research. Because growing up in the age that I feel like we grow up in, reading comics and catching up with all this history of comics is just impossible, or at least financially irresponsible, to try to actually read it all for yourself. And I find more enjoyment reading about the comics than I do reading the comics themselves. And sometimes I miss out on small little details like that. Sometimes I miss out on small little bits, some amazing artwork, but you know... Eventually, I'll find my way back to it. I've gone down a bunch of uh, Marvel and DC wiki rabbit holes, kind of like with YouTube. Like, I'll be like, oh, there's a hyperlink here for this character. Let's go read their fucking page. I've read so much of the DC and Marvel wikis, it's fucking insane. But I still can't remember all of it. So that's why it's like sometimes there's like bits and pieces that don't stick. Maybe if I actually read the comics, like it makes sense. The amount of comics I have is not a lot, but I have tons of research. People tell me lots of things like, yeah, man, that's us. I think that's the easiest way to do it. Do it. It's the most realistic way to do it. Go do it. Um, is that way? Because I have a, one of my best friends. He, he keeps up with all the Superman stuff, like every Superman comic. He is still 
currently reading every Superman comic. And I was like, I don't know how you do it, man. I don't know how you do it. Like between, I would have to stop the channel and just spend my time, my day reading to catch up on the comic book side of stuff. And I, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to feed it to me. Have uh, the MCU and D Disney uh, feed it to me and it'll, I'll take it there. I'll learn about it after the fact. See what I need to do. Because if I go into it with all these preconceived like notions about everything, then I'm going to have these expectations and then I'll end up being one of these other people who kind of have this idea of how these characters are supposed to be have these ideas of what might be coming. Oh, what but they might be setting up. And I'm just really going to be setting myself up for failure or disappointment. That's just always been my perspective. I'm the kind of guy, like if we talk about like a book that's been adapted into a movie, I will watch the movie before I read the book. Um, for two reasons. One, I'm lazy and I don't want to have, I'll let the movie tell me how the person's supposed to look. And then I go and I read the book with that person in mind. And then I see what the differences are. And I'm not disappointed by one or the other. I always see like the what's on screen as supplemental knowledge to what came from the source material. Game of Thrones was the same way. Uh, Harry Potter was the same way for me. And that way I was never like going into the movie being like, why didn't they do this thing from the book? I never had that problem. I did it the other way around and that way I enjoyed the movies and I enjoyed the books because the books in that way were different. They provided more than the movie and I wasn't pissed off at either thing. And I feel like it's the same. It's becoming the same thing with the comics, with these shows, with these movies, people are like wanting it to be the comics and it's just not, and it's never going to be. Woo. <laughs> Oh, fuck me, man. Who was the person who got you into superheroes? For me, it was my grandpa. Honestly, I don't know. My parents just kind of sat me down in front of a TV and let things happen. My mom did a lot of the support for me. So, like, none of my family was really into any of this stuff. Um, my dad was into sports, John Wayne, and banjo. My mom was a uh, church pianist and a singer. That's pretty much it. Um, outside of that, uh, it was just me, man. I grew up like I was born in the late 80s, grew up the majority of my life, my forming years in the 90s. And it's uh, that's pretty much it. I was just sat down in front of a TV while my mom was working. I mean, after a point, of course, she became a single mother. And a lot of the time was spent, I was watching TV, playing video games. And that's where I pretty much introduced my all my other stuff. My mom was like, are kids into this? Here you go. I had like a, a Sonic comic book. The only comic books I ever owned when I was a kid was like this really dark, horrific Batman comic, which I can't remember the name of it. I just remember the cover in my head. Uh, a Sonic the Hedgehog comic and a Spider-Man comic. And it was pretty interesting. It's kind of funny um, how that whole thing was going. It was, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think it was just like the, the, the TV. Cause I grew up right around the time when I hit like five years old, right when those shows started five, six years old. And so I hit right at the peak of Spider-Man, the animated series, Batman, the animated series, X-Men, the animated series, some of the great fucking TV, man. And yeah, that's really what started it. I mean, I watched the Batman 80, 89 film with Michael Keaton when I was younger. I think that was the first exposure to superhero stuff um, that I ever remembered. My mom liked the Adam West stuff, so that probably helped. I mean, she wasn't like big into it, but like she was aware of it because she watched a lot of that sitcom TV back in the time. So that's another reason that I was really, uh, had a lot of nostalgia for uh, WandaVision. It was like, I grew up with my mom watching... I Love Lucy, uh, Bewitched, I Dream of Jeannie, The Addams Family, The Munsters, all of that shit. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, it is 7 o'clock. So we're going to take a break. Um, I know a lot of you over on the other side of the coast are going to have to start getting ready for bed. 
I, how much have I drank? I from here to here. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Not a lot. But also remember, all I've had was that hot pocket. You, <laughs> that hot pocket you made me earlier. So it's fine. It's fine. We're fine. Um, if you guys are awake, if you guys are around, I'll be coming back in two hours and 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to be checking out the Resident Evil 8 Village demo. And uh, yeah, seeing, checking it out, seeing how it is, seeing what, it, uh, what it's like. Because I'm really looking forward to this game. Uh, I'm really looking forward to playing it. Uh, Resident Evil is probably one of the other, only, one of the few series of games that I'm going to stop what I'm doing to actually play through. A lot of the time, you know, I let time get away from me and stuff like that. And I don't get to play as many games as I would like to anymore. That, Final Fantasy, Kingdom Hearts, Devil May Cry, and Halo are probably the, the games that will get me to stop. And Pokemon are the games that will get me to stop in my tracks and check it out. So we're going to be streaming the demo. It's not going to be a long one. It's not a long demo. I think it's only 30 minute demo that we'll play later tonight. Uh, and we'll go from there. But yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you all who, uh, for everybody who super chatted. Thank you everybody for tuning in and seeing me uh, be a little, little sloshed for a hot <laughs> minute. We'll see how things go tonight. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. I'll catch you guys next time. Take care, everybody.